and welcome to Cult Movie Cult, where we watch and discuss the horrific, the obscure, and the flat-out strange from the other side of cinema. I am Mark Dickerson. And I'm Jeremy Fink. This is episode two, and today we are going to dive deeper into the films of Peter Jackson. We're going to continue part one, which is the early, early films of Peter Jackson. Last time we took a look at the first film that he produced, Bad Taste. Today, we're going to take a look at his second film, Meet the Feebles. Put your hands together for the fabulous Feebles Variety Hour! Meet the Feebles! Meet the Feebles! We're not your average! Ordinary people meet the Feebles! Meet the Feebles! So what you just heard was the intro song to Jackson's 1989 follow-up to 1987's Bad Taste, Meet the Feebles. Uh, initially, Jackson really wanted to make his what ended up being his third film, which was called Dead Alive, also known as Brain Dead. Uh, he wanted that to be the follow-up to Bad Taste, but after failing to put together funding, he ended up landing on a very, very strange film called Meet the Feebles. Yes, Meet the Feebles is basically uh, a demented, perverse take on the Muppets with all kinds of disgusting imagery, debauchery, and, of course, drugs. A um, <laughs> little bit of everything, I would say. Um, it's definitely a black comedy. Um, it is also a musical, um, as you just heard the, the main song there, um, which is very catchy, by the way. I actually found myself singing it afterwards yeah a lot of good um, mu- a lot of good music in this one actually <laughs> there is a lot of good music yeah um and I, I love musicals uh which i'm sure will come up later again on the show but mm-hmm. so that, that's just an added thing for me um so yeah the meet the feebles is like i said basically the muppets if they were all on drugs and having sex with each other and trying to kill each other um <laughs> you mean you, you mean they're not right uh, they're not doing that the muppets <laughs> uh, apparently not apparently i, I not. mean that's yeah we might have to look into that a bit but <laughs> Um, so they're running their own show. Um, I believe it's opening night for the show um, in the movie. It's k- kind of the main, uh, the core of the film. Like The Feebles, that is, right? The Feebles. The Feebles, the, yes. Yeah. Uh, you know, what everything's leading up to. Um, and, of course, you know, they have all kinds of uh, animals and all kinds of... Uh, I think there's actually, besides puppets, there's also uh, actors in suits, I believe, uh, for some mm-hmm. of the roles. Um, but, yeah, a lot of puppetry. Um there's the uh, a main character of Robert the Hedgehog, who's kind of like, uh, you know, he, we kind of see everything through his eyes. He's like the naive newcomer. Um, and he's sort, sort of the main character, although the movie kind of just goes around to different characters. And it is the type of film where every scene has something in it that just kind of stands out. And uh, you kind of can't point to any one scene. Um, although there is one specific scene, which I'll talk about later, that <laughs> I think probably does stand above the rest. But uh, yes. yeah, I mean, every scene is really just, you know, these puppets doing something bad. And uh, while that may sound like a a one note kind of you know novelty, I, I found it really worked. I don't know. How did you feel about this one? Yeah, so I actually really love this film. Uh, it might have in the in the episode we're doing today, or this the part one rather, the early early ones. It might actually be my surprising favorite of the three. Um, and I think I would have to agree with that. Actually. Yeah, yeah, it's just it's just so off the wall. I'm also have a real soft spot in my heart for backstage dramas. And mm-hmm. this is this is even though it maybe dives into some stereotypes. In terms of in terms of the characters in the backstage drama, I think a good way to describe this one would maybe be like the dirty red shoes. It just it it it, <laughs> yeah. it puts you behind the scenes of this very strange, fun uh, variety show with all of these animals. You know, these talking animals, these people in seats. You know, we have uh, so the the big boss, the big producer, is a guy named Bletch, who's a walrus. Mm-hmm. Um, we, we have his his one time love interest, but now kind of fading romance. Uh, Heidi the hippo. There's a drug addicted frog 
a uh, knife thrower named Weinerd, who is a Vietnam veteran. There's really some complex characters, and I think if this was something that had been done with just normal human beings, it, it might it might have actually just seemed like a very kind of uh, straight, intense backstage drama. But because it's set in this strange cartoonish, not unlike Bad Taste, this strange cartoonish world, uh, mm-hmm. it kind of brings it to a different level of of strange, disturbing, you know, strange, disturbing content. Yeah, it's it's. I mean, the way I look at it is, is that it's like a parody of of those types of films in a way. It's very satirical. Uh, it's like a commentary on like celebrity gossip culture, dark. You know, the dark side the of stardom. There's there's a fly in the film who I believe is named F W, but I could be wrong on that. Uh, uh, I, th- I think it's F W. Yeah, F W. Who is uh he's a gossip columnist, um, kind of right out of someone you would see in maybe the 1940s and 50s old Hollywood kind of system where he's just getting into everything everything they get into everything all the the actors and performers in this musical variety show get into the fly gets mm-hmm. gets he's, he's literally a fly on the wall and observes and, <laughs> and writes about it uh, uh-huh. it's a pretty interesting lot, lots of crazy characters like that yeah and we'll, we'll get into specifics of what we really like about the film and and the different moments um but first i wanted to talk about a little bit of the background obviously it's an extremely low budget film uh much like bad tastes i'm sure they had a bit more money for this one this one was seven hundred fifty thousand uh, dollars is the number yeah. that i found and uh um, so apparently more. yeah apparently it was originally conceived as part of a television series um but uh it actually became a feature once japanese investors um asked them to expand on the idea i guess which is an interesting thing. It's a, it's a yeah. sign, sign of the times where today mm-hmm. it would probably be the opposite, where if they wanted to make some serious money, they'd turn it into a TV show. That's very true. Yeah. That is very true. Um, so they hastily rewrote the script and they uh, made it into this feature, which, you know, it, it was a commercial failure when it first came out, um, when it was first released. Um, but obviously, you know, we're talking about it now on this show. So it went on to become <laughs> Stuck a, around. a cult. Cult film. Cult film. Yes. And um, this is kind of, kind of exemplifies cult films for me. I mean, it's a bizarre musical with odd, you know, practical effects. And I mean, it's everything about it. Just, you know, you would never picture anything like this in theaters now or anything that would be mainstream, at least. No, um, not at all. No. Yeah. And, uh, you know, again, with the like the effects and bad taste, um, you know, just all the work that went into making the puppets. I mean, I, I watched behind the scenes footage of this as well. And there was actually an example of the uh, walrus character just walking over to a desk and sitting down. And uh, Peter Jackson was saying that's something that would normally be one shot in a film, mm-hmm. in a normal film. But for this film, it was it would be at least three shots, three yeah. separate shots, uh, moving, you know, trying to move the puppet around and get them to sit right. And so if you just think about that, it's it's actually very impressive what went into, uh, you know, to making this movie. Yeah, it does rather look like a logistical nightmare when you really take a look at yeah. it. Um, you there's know, lot, there's a lot going on too. Like in each scene, if you look in the background, there's like lots of moving parts, so to speak, going on. Like, yeah. you know, all around, it's it's craziness ensuing in every scene. Yeah, it's basically a light a life size puppet show, um, which mm-hmm. but but just you know really like a, a lot of movement. You know, for puppets, a lot of crazy stuff going on. You know, there's a knife throwing scene. There's people hanging from the rafters. There's one infamous scene which the movie's kind of now most known for, where there's mm-hmm. this kind of extreme violent catharsis. Um, at the end, and a lot of this though is attributed to the the, the brilliance in the puppeteering work in this, and, and the creation of these these puppets is attributed to two people named Richard Taylor and Tanya Rogers, who Jackson was working with for the first time on this film. So Richard Tanya, Rich, Richard Taylor, and Tanya Rogers went on to create a, a company called Weta Workshops, and Weta Workshops has actually worked with Jackson all the way through his every single film since Meet the Feebles to today. So they were the people who were responsible for creating the orcs you know the huge orc armies and all you know all of the all of the strange you know effects and everything that have carried straight through all of his extreme films small to large that's loyalty right there let me tell you yeah um which is awesome uh so and you mentioned uh first time working with them it was also the first film that jackson co-wrote with his future wife fran walsh she went on to be a co-writer on his films after that as well um also, another connection to Bad Taste is uh, Jackson actually has a cameo as a Bad Taste alien. He's right. in the audience, which you have to kind of pause it uh, to, to see that. But yeah, it's it's a, it's a fun little tidbit there. Mm. Um, I actually found it interesting, and it makes sense when you look back at Jackson's earlier films, that he originally wanted to be a special effects guy. Yeah. Um, 
he had mentioned that in a, one of the interviews from the documentary I was watching, and that just totally makes sense. I mean, you know, these first these first three films especially are just special effects first, you know, story and everything after that, sure. But uh, it's it they're they're really just vehicles for, you know, these practical effects. Yeah. But what's interesting um, about Meet the Feebles, I think, as compared to Bad Taste and Dead Alive, is the the humanity, oddly enough, that's present in this film. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, there there are some even even though we're we're looking at, you know, puppets there, there's some real emotion present you really feel for these these little guys even though the situations are kind of insane you know there, for example like i said the there's you know, the drug addict frog who is a vietnam veteran um and there's a really wonderful uh a really wonderful reference to deer hunter um a strange little oh, yeah, scene of course which i actually a fun fact i learned that the deer hunter stuff was actually they ran out of money, so that was actually a lot of the Deer Hunter stuff was funded by crew members mm-hmm. and Jackson himself. Um, and I forget it was originally shot. I'll see if I can find it. It was shot under a different name. Um, oh, I think I saw that as well. It was uh, the the Frogs of War? Frogs of War, yeah. So that's so that's a, f- a fun little factoid right there. Um, but there there is really a lot of human human emotion present in this film, uh, which is strange for something that's just is so effects heavy. Just going to like a more personal note, um, you know, I saw this movie when I was much younger, probably around, I don't know, I guess around 1920, something like that. And it, it kind of blew my mind. Um, it's oddly watchable and, and fascinating in a way. Um, it has a very abstract feel to it. And again, like I said, you know, something that should be like a one note joke. Um, it, it takes on a life of its own and it goes lots of interesting places. Um, it's kind of better than it has a right to be. Yeah. <laughs> way, you know what I mean? If that it. makes sense. Yeah. yeah. Or, or than most people would expect. Um, mm-hmm. Partly because the puppet work is so impressive for such a low budget feature. Mm-hmm. Um, but also just, yeah, like you said, like the characters are kind of like human in a way, um, in a way that's, that you don't see in many films actually. Um, like there's different, you know, levels to their performances, which are just these puppets, but the way they, they acted with them is, you know, it just brings a different level to it. Yeah, and there's a real sense of culture in this movie as well. You know, if you talk about, you know, if you think about a movie, maybe like a Broadway Danny Rose, you know, or, or a lot of like a Gilda or something like that. Yeah. You know, these old classic Hollywood films. It, it, those movies are right in it this does, one. Yeah. Yeah, which I, th- I think... that feel. Mm-hmm. Yeah, which I think maybe is what helps it hold up over time. Because like you said, this this maybe is better than it has. It does hold up particularly well. Um, mm-hmm. Even, you know, where are we now you know, all these years later. Um, yeah. and, and I think another thing that we'd be amiss if we didn't talk about, though, is the music in this film. Oh, t- definitely. Uh, I mean, like I said, I'm a big fan of, of musicals, and this one, you know, combined with the dark humor, uh, just really, you know, and the songs are good, too. I mean, <laughs> yeah. And I like how the film starts with a fun song and dance and then immediately turns it on its head once the song is over and uh, you know you're watching something different and you're going into, like, a, a some kind of dark territory. Um, yeah, no, it does. It does go in a really interesting direction, but it does have that that kind of old fashioned Broadway feel to it, which uh, which you were talking about. Yeah, there was one. There was one little bit I noticed, just because th- the music is so present in our culture now. There's one bit when we're following around our main character um, Robert, um, yeah. where the the music bears a strange resemblance to La La Land, which I thought was kind of interesting. Uh, oh. Which I'm, I'm not making a claim, obviously, that Damien Chazelle. <laughs> or or Justin Horowitz at any point saw Meet the Feebles and used that as inspiration. But it does have that, that yeah. kind of Jacques to me, you know, like this loner lost in this musical, beautiful world feel to it. And then you see a frog in mainlining heroin, you know, yeah. and then a walrus getting a blowjob from a rabbit. And it, it gets in a very strange direction. Well, they actually explore some of the same themes, oddly enough, I would say. Yeah. Um, uh, you know, just celebrity culture and stardom you know, trying to achieve that goal and all that. Yeah, that um, longing. And also exactly. artis- artistic integrity. There's a really interesting character um, who is a director who really wants to pull off his big artistic vision, um, mm-hmm. and is, but just kind of keeps being put down by this producer type, mm-hmm. um, by, by Bletch, the big producer. Mm-hmm. Um, which, once again, really interesting. You know, as, as a young creator, I, I personally really felt for that granted the vision of the director once he actually gets an opportunity through some unforeseen circumstances to perform it is a little bit lurid um right but but there's a lot of heart in this film 
as we talk about the heart in this film, though, we, we can't forget, though, it is also incredibly lurid and incredibly mm-hmm. dangerous. Um, yes. Which all of that leads up to one huge climactic scene at the end, which I think we should talk about a little bit. A hippo with a machine gun uh, running around just slaughtering everyone that you've just seen in the film. Um, you know, that, that image is still very disturbing um, and it really stays with you probably more than any other scene in the film, I, w- I would think. I mean, that's when I think back on this film from seeing it years ago. I mean, that's what I think of. And especially like the climate, you know, not to get political or anything, but the climate we live in today, it's it's still, you know, it's even, it actually might even be more shocking yeah. to see that in a film now. These characters that you've just like watched throughout the entire film are just getting, you know, just mowed down. And uh, he obviously is making commentary on it, you know, with how everything ends up that she gets rehabilitated and works at a checkout line in a, a grocery store, you know. Yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, yeah. What did you th- what epilogue. Did you- yeah, yeah, no. I mean that moment for that? Me, that moment for me was incredibly cathartic. We're referring to Heidi the hippo kind of losing it, um, but but it's interesting, you know. We 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 you hear these stories of kind of th- this Hollywood fallout. My favorite is a story I heard about an actress named Peg Entwistle, I believe, who you know, was an early early Hollywood actress and actually ended up jumping off the H in the Hollywood sign. Yes. And mm-hmm. to, so so it, I think what's what's crazy about this this film is even though we're dealing with this extreme, extreme fiction, it's just how true these stories ring out. Um, and I, I think this is a movie, as, as strange as it is to see, is is kind of a quintessential Hollywood film, even if it's not necessarily mm-hmm. set in Hollywood. I think in yeah. terms of anyone getting into show business, th- like, this, is, this is a valuable piece of art to look at. Yeah, and, and what I actually forgot was how much the whole film kind of leads up to that scene in a way. Like, mm-hmm. it's almost all go, you know, all the things that occurred to Heidi the Hippo and, you know, all everything that happens along the, the course of the film is just like all culminates in that ending. And uh, yeah, cathartic is, is kind of the right word for it. It's, it's interesting. Yeah, you feel uh, it. It's horrific. Yeah, but you can feel it definitely. Um, but uh, if I had to pick, you know, a, a single scene that stood out that would have to be it but i mean every scene in it has something shocking going on and i think every form of human excrement makes an appearance of some kind oh I mean, my goodness yeah. it's just every you know the, the scene with the whale also stands out to me when they essentially drive through a whale mm-hmm. um and that whale uh puppet is very impressive it actually reminds me of the uh little shop of horrors audrey 2 puppet mm-hmm. in a way mm-hmm. um so yeah i mean just all around uh very different than bad taste um looking back on it it was actually surprised at how quite ambitious and different it was than uh, his first film yeah but yeah but it, it was an interesting departure from bad taste however uh in a review i found in the from 1995 which is a couple of years after the film was released but I, I don't believe that meet the feebles immediately made its way to the united states you know i don't i don't think it had the same kind of uh presence I, I think i think with a lot of jackson's films actually that they, they were successful in their time with the early films but i think once lord of the rings came out and, and heavenly creatures and you know a lot of his more recent bigger work people started going back um so i was able to find a 1995 review from the new york times i believe that bad uh, i believe that meet the feebles rather was showing at film forum and janet maslin of the new york times was quoted as saying, "Had Mr. Jackson not already used up the title Bad Taste on an earlier film, it would have fi- it would have fit Meet the Feebles well." Um, which is interesting that even though it is such a departure, it's clear that Jackson is still trying to just have fun at this point in his mm-hmm. career. You know, do whatever he can that's shocking, off the wall yeah. that he hasn't seen before. That that same energy from the yeah carries over definitely. I mean, you you might be able to call his, either, any of his first three films. I would say probably Bad Taste. Bad Taste would yeah. be a, would be a fitting title. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, well, uh, just my final thoughts on on uh, Meet the Feebles. I'm a huge fan of dark humor, uh, so I appreciate the look and the tone that he was going for, and uh, I appreciate all the work that went, went into the practical effects, of course. Um, and though it's disturbing and somewhat gross, uh, you know, I think it's definitely worth a watch. Yeah, uh, I agree. Yeah, definitely, definitely not for the faint of heart on this one. Um, I would say even more so than Bad Taste. Um, I think somehow, like we said, even though this one is set in this puppet world, it's somehow maybe more real than Bad Taste is. Um, somehow, yeah. Somehow. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but I think I think this one, like I said earlier, would definitely make a good double feature with something mm-hmm. like The Red Shoes or La La Land, as yeah. strange as that is. <laughs> so if you ever get the opportunity to watch those movies, you know, 
definitely <laughs> swing this one into your repertoire of of show of showbiz backstage dramas. I would go to that double feature. That's for sure. I would too. La La Land and uh, Meet the Feebles. <laughs> It'd be something. Um, so uh, one final thing here, I just wanted to uh, mention that there's a, a making of. Meet the Feebles, which I found on YouTube. It's called Sex, Drugs, and Soft Toys. Um, and we're going to put a link in the description for this episode. The Meet the Feebles documentary is not not very good quality. And the one I found was actually in three different parts. But, uh, you know, it's worth checking out just if you're curious at all how they made this film. And I like that at one point he actually refers to this film as a slice of cake rather than a slice of life film, which I found interesting. That's a, a Hitchcock, Hitchcock quote, right? I don't make I don't make slices of life, I make slices of cake. Which totally fits this film, I would totally say. Totally fits it, yeah. <laughs> Revolting cake, but... Uh, yeah. Well, that's going to do it for today's episode of Cult Movie Cult. We just took a look at Meet the Feebles, and next time we're going to continue with our exploration of Peter Jackson's early films, continuing with the early, early films, and we're going to finish that part out with the film Dead Alive. And I'm very much looking forward to talking about that one. All right, well, thanks for joining us again here on Cult Movie Cult, uh, where we explore the horrific, the obscure, and the flat-out strange from the other side of cinema. Thank you, and see you next time from the other side.